So what I thought we would do then is last time we did a lot of work with ionic compounds. And we talked about ionic compounds. And at the end of class, we did the crossover trick to look at the charges and find them. Is that correct? Sound familiar? Yes, no? Yes. OK. Um, but I felt like we hurried through it all to some extent. So I want to go back and kind of look at it again and work an example to kind of bring everyone up to speed for today as we go through it. So what I'd like to do is look at the reaction between beryllium and chlorine. So beryllium is going to react with chlorine to form a compound out of this. Now, I know we've got several ways to do this. But the first thing that I want you to do, one, is predict the compound that forms. using dot diagrams. <clears throat> now, uh, did we do an example of this in class using dot diagrams to predict it where you move the electrons over? Yeah. yeah, OK. So let's go ahead and see if we can predict the compound that's going to form between beryllium and chlorine uh, using dot diagrams first. Say 30 seconds or so to get your ideas down. Okay. Everyone got their ideas? So we're going to start out with beryllium. And how many dots am I going to put around beryllium for its dot diagram? Two. Two indeed. It's in the second column of the periodic table, so it has two valence electrons. Two valence electrons corresponds to the two dots. Then we have chlorine. And how many are going to go around chlorine? Seven. Okay. So here we are, and we need to fulfill the octet rule. So beryllium is going to donate one to that chlorine. Now when it donates one to the chlorine, the chlorine has fulfilled the octet rule and it's perfectly happy. Is the beryllium happy just giving up one? No. No, it's not. It needs to give up two so that it can get rid of its shell. So it's going to find another chlorine atom. And donate that electron to a second chlorine atom. It can do this. Because when we react things together, we can't just pick up one atom of one element and one atom of another element and put them together. They have to actually be thousands and thousands and billions of these things all together at a time. Remember how small atoms were? We can't go in and just pick up individual ones and put them together. Okay? Since there's always a lot of them around, you can always just find another chlorine for that to react with. So if for every one beryllium, it takes two chlorines. The compound that forms is going to be BeCl2. BeCl2. Questions about that? Okay. Now, this is starting out the dot diagram the most, I actually think it's the simplest form of predicting it because you're really just moving the dots around to fulfill the octets. Uh, but it also takes the longest amount of time. So you only really need to do 
the dot diagrams to predict products when I ask specifically for it. I'll say something like, using the dot diagram, predict this, or something along those lines. If I just said predict the formula, then you can do it however you want. But in this case, I'm going to say use the crossover trick. to predict the product. Now this one should take you significantly less time because you're not drawing everything out, I guess. Uh, but you do have to know the charges for things. So what charge does beryllium take on when it goes into a compound? Anyone remember? Plus two? Plus two, and that's right. Because it's going to give up two electrons. And when it gives up two electrons, it's giving up two negatives. Since it gives up two negatives, it's going to end up as a plus two. Chlorine, on the other hand, is a halogen. And the halogens end up taking on one electron. So it becomes a minus one. Plus two and minus one. Basically, it's what has to happen for it to fulfill the upset <coughs> rule. Then for the crossover trick, we're going to bring them as substrips. And generally, chemists leave the one off. So we again find the same thing, BeCl2. Now, as you go through this, you're going to learn it's true, but it's kind of easier just to remember it. If you look at the periodic table, the charges, this one is plus 1, this one is plus 2, this one is plus 3. This is going to be plus 4 or minus 4. Then we start with the negative, so minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. So going across the table, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, and then 0 on the end. Okay. So you can kind of remember it that way as well for the non-transition metals. So wherever it sits, you just know the charge. So Polonium, 84 here. It's under oxygen. It's in this one, so it's going to be a minus 2. Straightforward like that. Okay, beryllium then. Second column is plus 2. Chlorine, seventh column. It's a minus 1. So you just can remember that. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, let's do gallium and sulfur. You could just do the crossover trick if you want. I guess I'm not checking either way. So. Say another 10 seconds or so. Okay. Uh, anyone feeling brave and want to share what they got for an answer? Questions about that? 
So we're starting to get into some material that's new for people and so forth. Uh, and I really want to stress to you guys that you keep up with the materials we're going through. So for example, on this one right here, the answer, gallium 2 sulfur 3, can be traced all the way back to when we figured out how many protons, electrons, and neutrons were inside of an atom. So inside the atom, it's made up of these components. That then led to the Bohr model. The Bohr model led to the valence electrons. Valence electrons led to the dot diagram and the octet rule. And then that led to our product. So these things are building upon themselves. And we're going to continue doing this throughout the chapter. So this class has been great about attendance and everything. I'm not going to even harp on you about that in any way, shape, or form. Just make sure like, you're keeping up on things. Um, in my other class, I had a student who showed up after missing two days. And they hadn't covered any of the ionic stuff. So when we jumped into this part, coming up with formulas, obviously completely lost. Okay. They're going to have a hard time catching up. So um, it's just important to keep up with the material and so forth. It's really, really easy to get in a hole and not be able to get out of it. But for now, we're good with GA2S3. Okay. Is that compound going to be ionically bonded? or covalently bonded? Um, Ionic, and why do you say that? Because it's a metal and not metal. Exactly right, exactly right. Gallium is a metal, sulfur is a non-metal, so that means it's going to be ionic, okay, and ionic bonds. The other thing is we have charges here that they take on, meaning that they form ions, so that leads to ionic bonding. Do you guys feel comfortable with predicting products that come out of these? Yes, shake your heads, yes, no, I don't know. There's really only two ways to do it. Okay. Got a few smiles, that's all I care about. So once we can go through and figure out the naming of it, I just realized what it's weird, the lights are on. I don't care if I turn off the lights. Fall asleep. Once we can go through and predict the products that come out, we want to be able to name them. Now, naming chemicals and products like this may seem like it's very, very complicated, but it's not. And to be honest, you guys actually know a lot of the names of these things, whether you know, realize it or not. So table salt is sodium chloride. And That would be the name of it there, and you're probably familiar with that. Um, magnesium chloride is the next one over there. So when we're going about naming them, there's two basic rules we want when we're naming things. The first one is that the cation name stays the same. So whatever your first element is, that first element's name stays the same. And then second says that the anion's ending, so the anion or the second element's ending, changes to an IDE. And really, this is the basic rules for ionic compounds. As long as your compound is ionic, then these are going to hold true. So if we come over here to these examples, BE is the first one, so that's going to stay the same. I wish I could remember how to spell beryllium. Completely blanked. Wait, I got a periodic table. I can do this. Okay. 
right. Beryllium is B E R Y L L I U F. So that's going to stay the same. And for our second one, that's going to be gallium, which is going to stay the same as well. And gallium has two L's, of course. Got it. So beryllium and gallium. Now, that means the cations stay the same. The anion ending is going to change to an IDE. So we start out here with chlorine, and we're going to change that ending to an IDE or chloride. Chloride. So the name of BeCl2 is going to be barium chloride. Barium chloride. Make sense? Yeah. Do you ever put the, the chlorine in front of the B, like Cl2, B, or is it always the... In chemistry, what we... We list metals first, because they're the cations in this case. But as a general rule, whichever element is furthest to the left on the periodic table gets listed first. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but generally that's the idea. So the BE will be first. Now, if you reverse them and you wrote chlorine beryllide, I'm probably going to accept it anyway. Um, just because you show that you knew the rules, you just got confused on that convention part of it. Um, in terms of naming, there's a lot of those types of things that we're going to talk about. So the second one, for example, is gallium. And it's sulfur. That's going to change to sulfide. So the name here is gallium sulfide. Gallium sulfide. Seem good? Two rules. First one, it's not really a rule, the name just stays the same. Okay, so let's have you guys try a couple of them. First <laughs> off, let's do. Al2O3 and Ca, Ca, and so it's going to be Ca3, N2. Aluminum, oxygen, calcium, and nitrogen. Everyone got their ideas? So Al2O3, Al is going to be aluminum. And the O3 is going to be oxide. So the name of this one is going to be aluminum oxide. Then over here, the second one, Ca3N2 is going to be calcium. And then nitride. Calcium nitride. 
So nitrogen gets gets shortened down to nitride. Yeah. So besides the carbon family, you say B plus mm -hmm. four or minus four, but it's only this rule's only affecting what about fifteen elements? Um which rule? The IDE? The, the IDE. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they're gonna be the non metals be, associated yeah. with it. Do you guys feel comfortable with that? Yes, no? Okay. Um. Okay, so let's do one more example here. to say we're going to react lithium and nitrogen. And lithium and nitrogen. So predict the product that would form between lithium and nitrogen and then name it. So the product between lithium and nitrogen is going to be Li3N. Li3N. Is that what everyone got? No? Okay. And then the name for this is going to be lithium. Nitride. Lithium nitride. Okay. Everyone agree with that? Okay. So what about if we're going the other direction? Instead of going from the formula to the name, what if we're going from the name to the formula? So for example, if I was to write calcium, Chloride. Calcium chloride here. How would you go about figuring out the formula for this? Well, the way you're going to do it is first, you figure out what elements are involved in the bonding, so or in the compound. It's going to be calcium and chlorine. But the thing you have to do and make sure of is that the balance, the charges balance one another. So what charge does calcium have in a compound? Plus two. Plus two. And what chlorine is a minus one still. So you have to remember to bring these down as subscripts. And CaCl2. CaCl2. So let's have you guys give one a try. Let's do um, sodium. Sodium. 
oxide. Sodium oxide. Sodium oxide then. Everyone got their ideas? Oh, yeah. Started asking. I do it because I don't even think about it, but that's just the way it is. Yep. Okay, sodium oxide then. Uh, sodium is going to be Na. Oxygen is going to be O. And the final product that forms here is going to be Na2O. Na2O. with that? 